Have you purchased a new electronic speed controller for your rock crawler or any other rig for that matter and you put it in and it didn't quite work out right? Well, you probably need to program it for your use. I'm John Holmes and this is programming your brushless ESE. So what I have here is a TRX4 and I've gutted the stock electronics out of it and have replaced it with a Revolver 540 of the 1800 kV version and also a Sidewinder 4 and as you can see by the completely messy rat's nest of wiring I haven't done anything as far as cleaning that up and I'm constantly changing electronics so on this particular rig I'm probably not going to clean it up but we're actually in luck today because I need to reprogram the ESC and if I had the wires really tucked away I may not be able to get to it so it's actually a good thing and the reason why I usually have a complete rat's nest of wiring. So the items that we will need today for programming this brushless ESC, which is a Sidewinder 4, is the actual ESC itself. The ESC will need to be unplugged from the radio. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And it's usually in channel 2 on most radios. Channel 2. So we unplug the little RX wire. If you're programming a Tekken controller, you'll need to do the same thing. Castle does have a little programming Y harness that you can buy so that you don't have to do this. I've never used one personally because it's really not too big of a deal for me. And uh, Hobby Wing will actually have a separate wire for the ESC to program with. So you won't need to unplug it from your speed controller or from your radio. So the next thing that we need is of course the programming chip from Castle. This one's called the C-Link or Castle Link. And then we'll also need the USB cable to adapt it into the computer as well as a computer for programming. Now they do have a Bluetooth adapter called the B-Link, this little guy right here. And I do believe the B-Link can actually be situated inside of your rig so you don't have to get to it when you're doing the programming. And their software is actually a fully functional Castle programming software. So all the features that we see today, you will also see on the B-Link software. But for ease, since I can do everything on a computer and actually show you, we're going to do it on the computer today. But just know that the process is identical when using their B-Link adapter. It also works with our own Holmes ESCs too. So everything that's OEM through Castle also works with their B-Link. So we are going to start by plugging our USB cable into the computer. And we do already have the Castle Link software booted up and installed. And we're using Castle Link 3.77 today. So you always want to make sure that your Castle Link is installed and running before you plug in your little uh, Castle Link adapter. So we're going to plug that in next and we should see the program update with a little green light. There we go. To tell us USB connected. And it is, as you can see right here. So now that our USB is connected, we plug that into the radio. And the, the link is showing red to tell us that it's plugged into the computer right now and, and linked. And you can maybe see right next to that red LED, there's some little symbols. Pl uh, minus, a plus, and then what looks like, oh, a U. It's actually a signal. So our negative is brown in this case. Sometimes it's black, sometimes it's brown. Our positive is red, which is in the middle of the plug, and then our yellow is the signal. If we plug this in wrong, it won't do anything, but if we plug it in right, and you see the green light lit up there. We also had an update to Castle Link to tell us, hey, everything is plugged in. It also told us at the same time that we had fresh firmware. So instead of simply programming this ESC today, we're actually going to update the firmware too. And a lot of times the firmware will have fixes to say software bugs or maybe just additional features. All right, our current firmware, as you can see, is version 2.04 and available is 2.05. They even have a revision history on here to tell us what the changes are. So let's look at this. It corrected a compatibility issue with the B-Link device. Good to know. Let's update the firmware. Do not disconnect the device or the power while we're doing this. That is always a good plan. You can brick your device if you do that by accident. And proceed. So now we, we essentially wait. Uh, status step one of two, it is essentially reading the ESE to see, hey, do we have enough room to push this into it? And then step two of two is pushing in the data. 
which is new firmware and new settings and everything. Sometimes the old settings will transfer into your new firmware. Sometimes they won't. Depends on the manufacturer and depends on the temperature of the day, it seems sometimes. Uh, I've updated firmware before and I didn't have anything move over and had to redo everything. And sometimes it was as if nothing had happened before. So we'll just have to take a look. All right. So it is updated. That was fairly painless, fairly quick. We'll stretch this back out. And as you can see on the screen, it, it tells us we're connected to a Sidewinder 4. It also tells us what it is. And we have tons of tabs up top. Our save print, so if you want to save your settings so that you can upload it onto different ESCs, that's always a good idea. Our software, which we already looked at, shows us our firmware, 2.05. We've got a brake curve, and we've got a throttle curve. And hey, look, it did, in fact, keep our throttle curve that I had set. And this one is not too aggressive. It looks like I have 30% on the throttle side set at 60% inside the ESC, and I actually like just a little bit more slope. So we're going to go with 30% at 70% input throttle. Now, motor type, motor direction. We can either set it normal or reversed. Since this is a sensorless motor in a sensorless ESC, we could also just switch two wires on the motor and it would do the same thing. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe it's hard soldered in. Um, but we do have the option for the motor direction to make it normal or reverse. We also have our motor type right below that, brushless or brushed reversing. So if we want to use a brushed motor with this, we can. And next on the motor, we have sensorless motor timing. And maybe best for me to pull this up and just show you what Castle says. Lowest timing, best for bashing, uh, highest timing, check your motor temperatures. The more timing that you add, the more power you'll get out of a system, out of a motor specifically, but the lower the efficiency will be at the same time. So you're trading RPM for efficiency or in a way for torque. Since we are gonna be rock crawling with this and essentially just bashing around, we want lowest timing. So essentially zero degrees of timing. Um, also, since this is an outrunner, a very high pole count motor, it does not respond very well to high timing advance. So we're going to use low timing pretty much no matter what on an outrunner. So no changes on that. Now we go to the advanced settings, our arming time, our live link, and our throttle deadband. So the stock 1.5 second arming time seems good for the stock radio. It, it doesn't have any issues with the radio taking too long to boot up. But maybe there's other radios that do take too long to boot up. If you have any experience with a radio that does not work with the stock 1.5 second arming time, let me know in the comments. I'd like to know. Now, live link. This is where the ESC would talk with my radio and actually send telemetry data back to me. I don't use that. I'm just a crawler. I really don't need to know all the, the fancy insides. If I need to know, say, how hot my ESC is running, then I can just throw a temperature gauge on my ESC and see directly. I kind of like to, well, in a crawler, you're standing right behind it, so there's not much reason to have a link. But maybe you're a racer. Do you actually use the link? I'd like to know that too. And throttle dead band. So with the stock radio, the 0.1 millisecond dead band is pretty nice. It gives us the best throttle resolution and feel without being too jittery on a stock radio. On some lower quality radios though, you may have to increase your dead band up to say 0.15 milliseconds. Have you had this problem? And if so, let me know what radio caused it. But typically I just run at the average 0.1 millisecond dead band. And maybe some of the nicer radios you can run are a very small dead band though. And I have a Futaba 4PK. It's kind of an old one, but on that one, it is nice enough that I can run a pretty tight uh, dead band on there and get even more throttle resolution to the trigger pull. Um, if you run a really small one, let me know what radio works with that. But this is just a stock Traxxas radio. 0.1 millisecond dead band is just fine. So we're going to keep it that way. Next up is the power settings. Start power. This essentially tells the ESC how, how fast to put on the throttle, but on a very, very small time scale. Um, low startup power is essentially what it comes with. And a lot of people find that low startup power has better startup. I find that high startup power actually has better startup in a crawler. Um, if you have a different opinion though, let me know. And also tell me what motor that you're running because that is actually important on the startup power. But I find that high startup power is the most consistent startup with all of my motors. I usually run 3S LiPo, maybe that makes a difference, maybe it doesn't. 
but that is what I like to use. Reverse percentage is the next one, and I like 100% reverse, so I have full reverse speed to get out of a climb if I'm gonna topple over backwards. Uh, but maybe you run a little bit less, let me know if that's the case. And then punch control. This is one of the lesser understood portions of programming a brushless speed controller. Um, I'm not sure if Hobbywing has anything similar. Tekken does, but they call it something different, and unfortunately I don't know what they call it. But the punch control is essentially a slightly wider time scale of how much power will we let the motor pull. A 0% punch control lets the motor pull as much amperage as it can when you grab full throttle. Uh, so essentially our amperage is only limited by the resistance of the battery, the resistance of the motor, and the resistance of the ESC. And a lot of times we're talking milliohms. So you may be able to pull hundreds and hundreds of amps if you just dead short from a dead stop and pull it hard. But your battery won't like it. I can guarantee that your battery will not like that and you'll probably have a brownout or you may have a blackout where the system completely shuts down. So a way to get around this, instead of uh, adding in some dampening on your radio if you have a fancier radio, or instead of making your start power low to get around it, what I do is I add a little bit of punch control. 30% is generally enough to start uh, to stop all brownouts on a system. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're racing, if you're crawling, if you're doing anything. This will keep your brownouts from happening, but honestly, you probably won't notice any lag in your acceleration. So it's a kind of a, a good range to be in, but maybe you like to use a little bit less and you don't have brownouts. Maybe your batteries are bigger. Let me know in the comments if you have a setup that actually works with a lower punch control, or maybe you even like more punch control to smooth out that throttle delivery and keep you from breaking parts. But I like 30%. It's a really good round number that keeps me having just fantastic acceleration and top power, but without brownouts. And I kind of like to use small batteries. Um, 2200s, 3200s, little guys. You know, pretty, pretty small size batteries for what they are. Some people use larger batteries and you can get away with less punch control. But since I use the smaller batteries, these particular ones are 3500 milliamp from Helios RC and they are a 30C discharge. Plenty of power, but just to be sure we don't brown out, we have 30% punch control. All right, the torque limit. The torque limit is something that I don't actually mess with in the castle uh, speed controllers. And this is more for racing when you have maybe a slick track that doesn't, you know, you just don't have as much traction and you can't put down as much power in the middle of your power band. Uh, and in the middle is actually where you can put down the most power in electric motor. Uh, so for my use, I don't use this, but maybe you do. And if you do, let me know. I would love to hear from you on, on what applications this is actually good for you. But for rock crawling and for what I do, I never need the torque limit. So we are going to skip over that. Now we are to the basics. Auto LiPo cutoff. This is what tells your ESC when to stop running because LiPos really don't like going below about three volts per cell. And I believe their auto is somewhere around 3.2 or 3.3 volts per cell normally, but you can set this to an exact value. So if you go to custom, then it's gonna be four volts per cell. Uh, that's way too high. I would knock this down to 3.2 or, or 3.5. Oh, I see. This is actually a bulk cutoff for custom. So if you're running three cells and you want a cutoff that's three volts per cell, then we would do nine volts cutoff for a three cell LiPo. But again, I just run with the auto LiPo. It works great. Um, yeah, here's our per cell cutoff below that. 3.2 volts per cell is pretty good. In a crawler, you can actually go up a little higher. Uh, and be fine if you want your batteries to last longer. 3.4, 3.5 volts per cell will, will not beat on them and as hard since it's a pretty low amp draw. You're gonna find that your cells stay in balance more and actually last longer on the shelf. If you use a higher voltage cutoff like I do sometimes, let me know. But the 3.2 volts per cell is a good safe cutoff for use. Um, if you wanna go even lower than that, three, three volts per cell or even on the, uh, the custom setting, you can do that if you're racing and you wanna make sure you get everything you can out of your pack, but it really beats on LiPo's hard going below three volts per cell, whether it's loaded or not. So being safer, 3.2, actually I'm gonna bump mine to 3.3 volts per cell, and uh, yeah, 3.4, let's go to 3.4. It may make about 10% difference in runtime, maybe 8% at 3.4, uh, but in terms of how long your battery pack will last as far as sitting on the shelf and cycling it, instead of getting maybe 30 cycles out of it, if we can take 10% off the bottom with this voltage cutoff, you can double or triple your cycle life on a battery. And that's really useful. 
Um, especially when you're crawling and, and you don't need to beat on your packs as hard for a race or something like that. Just bump that auto lipo up just a little bit and you can get a lot more use out of your lipos. Instead of say one season or one year, you can get two years or three years. I have a lot of lipos on the shelf that I have been using for four and five years using a very, um, a very conservative cutoff and then also charging my batteries up to a lower voltage as well. 4.18 volts per cell is what I typically go to. That's probably for another day. Probably for another day. Let's keep on task here. So reverse type. I'm in a crawler, so crawler reverse is gonna make sense. With reverse on this ESE is a double tap reverse. And since I'm on the rocks, I want instantaneous reverse to flip me backwards, uh, or so I don't flip backwards. Uh, so we, we want that crawler reverse. Without reverse would be a racing situation, I think. There's really no reason uh, for a basher or any crawler to have no reverse, unless you just want to punish yourself. Uh, so we're going to stick with crawler reverse here. Instant reverse, that it could also be called. Now they also have these final few settings here. Idle or error beep disable. Um, I disable my idle beeps, so if it's just sitting there not doing anything, it'll start to beep every 15 seconds, I think. It can get kind of annoying, and if you want to know if your vehicle's accidentally left plug in, though, it's great to have. Uh, but I'm going to disable the idle beeps. The error beeps are usually good to keep, though, so if, if I do hit voltage cutoff, it'll give me a little error beep, and it'll continue to give me an error beep after it comes to, so to speak, and let me know that. They also have more information on this. Uh, it's a lot to read. I don't think it really matters for us today. Just know that you have the ability to select if it gives you any beeps or not. All right, brake amount. Since we use drag brake, we really don't need a brake amount on here. But some people like to use it. How about yourself? I don't, I don't even use the brakes. I, I let my drag brakes do all the work for us. So it's not really useful. I keep it at 50% just because. Now, what is more important is the drag brake amount. Now the drag brake is when you're off throttle, when you're in neutral and you're coasting essentially, it puts the brakes on so the vehicle doesn't roll. The revolver, as you can see, inherently has a lot of Deaton force to it so we can't roll it easily by itself. So we don't need a lot of drag brake. Once it's going, 30% drag brake tends to be a really good setting for the revolver in particular. If you use the revolver, I'd like to know what you set for your drag brake. If you're using something like a four pole inrunner, you probably need more drag brake though, in which case we would probably set this up to 100% crawler, full on style drag brake. Um, if you're running a four pole, maybe a slate or something like that, let us know in the comments what you are running. All right, so that's pretty much it. We're gonna hit update and go from there. Update of settings complete, we're done. So that's it. Uh, I, I spent a lot more time explaining what was going on than the actual programming itself. Usually it only takes about 30 seconds to get it done. But now that we are done, we're gonna go in reverse order again. So as you can see, we are plugged in. We have both the green and the red LED on the Castle Link chip. I'm gonna unplug that. It'll go to the red LED on the chip, letting us know that it is not connected to the ESC anymore, but that it's still connected to the computer. And as you can see, it also updated our screen. So now we're going to unplug the USB from the computer. And then the Castle Link will update and the green light will go out saying the USB is not connected now. So there we have it. We programmed our ESC, in this case a TRX4 for crawling, exactly like I wanted. Can't wait to test it out. If you do have any questions that I didn't get to, please comment down below and I will get to them. Well, thanks for tuning in. Have a good one.